Okay, so chapter three is just a sort of a description, more in-depth de in description of what natural selection is in the first part, and then what natural selection Um, so if we go back in time, by about the mid-1970s, this sort of descent with modification was fairly well um, established in the scientific community. Um, I say fairly well instead of like, uh, you know, unchallenged in the scientific community because it was, there were, there were a couple of, there were a couple of different, there were a couple of issues that were still kind of unanswered in the 1870s, one of the big issues was the age of the Earth. People had uh, begun to estimate the age of the Earth, and a lot of the estimates, like I said, uh, be mentioned before, like if you you know were measuring how long Niagara Falls had been here, you could say, okay, it's been here at least 100,000, 200,000 years old. But they still, we weren't, we still were not estimating things that the Earth, or at least features on the Earth that were old enough to really give enough time for evolution to occur. One scientist, Lord Kelvin of the day, did an estimate on a, uh, basically the, took the size of the Earth and said, okay, let's say at time zero, this was just a molten ball of fire. And since time zero, since the creation is a molten ball of fire, it has now been cooling, right? And they knew that at the time the Earth had a molten core, and he said, okay, a molten ball of fire the size of the earth could, and, and, he, and he estimated all these cooling times to it, could not be any older than about 70 million years, right? And scientists of the day said, yeah, that causes some, a, a, some problems, right? For this very, very slow process of generating the biodiversity that they were seeing, they were saying that's maybe not old enough. And so we eventually figured out that, okay, the, the Earth isn't cooling like a big chunk of charcoal, right, where it's just slowly cooling down. It actually is generating heat through which processes? Anybody know? What's that? Yeah, 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 radiometric decay, nuclear process, nuclear fission, and fusion going on at the core. I guess is there fusion going on at the core? Fusion or fission, one of those two, but it's basically radiometric decay. It's still generating heat, right? And so we ended up solving that. The other one was how things were inherited. Blending inheritance was a big, big problem for uh, Darwin's idea of evolution via natural selection because if you were to generate positive mutations, right, if you had blending inheritance, what would that mean? That would mean that, okay, let's say you have you know, a whole bunch of all black bunny rabbits living in a snow field. All of a sudden there's a mutation for a white rabbit, right? And the white rabbit would then, the original mutate, mutant, right, would necessarily have to mate with a black rabbit. If it was blending inheritance, what would happen? The offspring would be kind of gray. Then the offspring, the gray ones, would then necessarily, or most likely, then mate with another black, what would happen? It would then become almost black again. And then, you know, every generation, the positive effect of, a, uh, of that mutation would be halved. And so scientists were saying, no, this doesn't make sense. This, it, we, it, we just can't see a reasonable way in how that could, that positive trait could then be passed down to all the different offspring. So then who kind of answered that question problem for us? Which scientist? Yeah, Gregor Mendel. So Gregor Mendel. He said, well, actually inheritance isn't, we don't have blending inheritance. In fact, what we have is particulate inheritance. But um, for the most part, you know, 1870s, uh, the, this, at least the model descent with modification was accepted, but we were still arguing about the process. It wasn't until about the 1920s, 1930s, what we call the modern synthesis, that we actually as a scientific community said, okay, yes, we, we now not only have a good description of the pattern, but we also have a good description of the process, and that process is descent with modification. Darwin was the one that proposed the process. Okay, so let's look at that process. So to understand the mechanism of, of um, evolution, Darwin and many other people said, okay, let's look at how um, we have been able to create new varieties, how we've been able to mold 
different populations through artificial selection. And so Darwin was, uh, you know, kept pigeons and things like that in England, in especially Victorian England. You know, that was a popular thing to do. Different dog, dog breeding was a, a popular thing to do. Um, agricultural breeding and selection had been, you know, a popular thing to do for survivor to survive as a human population for a long, long time. So people were familiar with what we call artificial selection, right? You have a crop. You pick the seeds that um, best, that give you sort of the best yield. You take the best yield seeds and you plant them in the next generation. Then you take the next best, the next, you know, that second generation. You take the best yielding seeds and use them for the next generation. So we were very um, familiar with artificial selection. Looking here at dogs, you can see the a massive amount of variation or changes that we could create in dogs through artificial selection. And so Darwin was just coming along and saying, okay, if we can get these massive changes over short periods of time artificially, like manipulated through us, why can't nature do the same thing through the same sort of process over a dramatically longer period? Here are just a couple of examples of, of, you know, what people in Darwin's day were familiar with the power of artificial selection. Here's the wild tomato versus, you know, one of our domestic tomatoes. Um, they can still interbreed with a bunch of wild tomato species found in uh, South America. Morphology, another one of our plant species. Um, if has anybody ever grown uh, broccoli in your garden or, or cauliflower? I did it one year. It's pretty disappointing, I think. It's this massive plant. You do it all season long. You get one little floret that you can buy for like a dollar at the store. So, yeah, but it when you see them coming out, I planted, uh, I actually planted Brussels sprouts, uh, broccoli, and um, cauliflower all in the same year. And amazingly enough, it comes out and they look all very, very similar. Why is that? Because they're all derived from wild cabbage. Not only are they derived from wild cabbage, right? But cabbage obviously is derived from wild cabbage. And kohlrabi also is derived from wild cabbage. So you have this ancestral wild cabbage and you have artificial selection in these different lineages for deposition of carbohydrates in different areas of the wild cabbage plant. If you uh, select for, you know, a lot of carbs in the flower cluster, you get broccoli or, or cauliflower. If you select a, for carbohydrate de deposits in the lateral buds, you get Brussels sprouts. If you do it in the shoots, you get the, the cabbage. If you do it in the stem and the leaf base, you get kohlrabi. And so we can take one single plant, and even within one single plant, depending on what parts we're selecting for, we can get create dramatically different. We also can do more, not only just morphology, but behavior. We can select for behavior. Um, like I mentioned before, Darwin was super into pigeons and raising pigeons. We have different pigeons, like has anybody ever seen a Birmingham roller pigeon in flight? This is one where we select for um, a behavior. I'll show you the behavior here in a second. This tumbler pigeon too. I mean, we can, we can, artificial selection and breeding is so powerful that we can breed for stuff that's just totally ridiculous. Like, look at the tumbler pigeon. I mean, look at, uh, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but look at some of the pet, the dog breeds. They're, they're sort of ridiculous, some of these things that we can do, but that just underscores this idea that we have a lot of power at manipulating through a process of artificial selection, different, um, different organisms. So here let's watch the tumbler pigeon. It's a silent video. So if you're watching this on the when you watch this on the video you have to click it. Hopefully it still is there. But it's a it's a really, really interesting behavior that we can select for and we can trump natural selection because we have this artificial situation. And then some of these you look at them and you're like, yeah, there's no way that this thing would ever survive in the wild. Do I have to do Choose add-ons? What should I do? Several add-ons already. Should I just leave it? 
Somebody who's more, where's Daniel? Daniel always tells me what to do in these situations. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, so this is, this is what the Birmingham ro uh, rollers do. So here you'll see them, they'll just be in, in flight, right? And then all of a sudden, geez, this is super slow. I thought these would be like new computers. Oh, here we go. Okay, so they're in flight, and all of a sudden, just spontaneously, they go into these like nose dive, rolling tumbles. So here's the of artificial selection. So, um, what's the mechanism by which things evolve artificially? Yeah, so what do they have to do? So, one, you have to get a, let's just say we're going to do a, uh, some some corn, right? So, have you all seen the uh, teosinte corn? It's just this, the, the native corn is like this big, right? It kind of looks like the salad bar little corns you put on your salad, right? It's not. It's a totally different thing, but it's about that size, right? So if we had a whole crop of that, pretend we, we were, you know, 10,000 years ago down in central Mexico. We had a crop of that. What would we do? Well, we would have to have, we'd have to look at the crop, and first thing that we'd have to have is we'd have to say, okay, there's, there's some variation. Not all the little teosintes are the same, right? Some of them are a little bit bigger and have a few more carbohydrates, right? So one, we'd have to look for variation in that population, right? Two, we would have to do what? Pick the trait. Yeah, one, you'd have to pick the trait. Once we pick the trait, we said, okay, that's deposit, that, that, the, these ones over here have to have, um, have to have more carbohydrates. What else is really important? It has to have a genetic component. There has to be some sort of genetic component tied to that trait, right? And then the ones that we select can't do, we can't, if we were, if we were there and we just wanted to go randomly sample all of the different, you know, said, all right, we said, okay, we're going to put a blindfold on and just select the ones that we want for the next generation. Are you going to have, or is that going to be a successful artificial selection sort of experiment? No, it has to be directed. It has to be, some of them have to have a, higher chance of being selected than others, the ones that have that higher chance, it's going to be non-random, very much non-random, and we're going to choose that one for the particular trait that we're looking for, right? That's the exact same thing, exact same process that happens naturally, okay? So, one, here we have a, sort of a hypothetical um, population of um, chili peppers, right? And they vary in degrees of spiciness, right? So up there, number one, is there variation in that population? Yeah, some of the chili peppers are spicy, some are not so spicy. Two, is that variation uh, inherited? Because you can have variation that doesn't have a genetic component. Maybe some of them just, you know, were, had access to the, some minerals in the ground, there is variation in the minerals in the ground. The ones that grew where there was a lot of minerals, whatever this mineral is in the ground, were spicy. The ones that grew where there wasn't, they weren't spicy, right? So two, that has to be heritable. Three, more individuals um, 
Is that time to go? Somebody set an alarm today? No? Oh, it is, okay, let's finish this slide. So, more individuals uh, need to be born than can survive and reproduce, right? So you have to have that, that material first. And then some of the variants uh, will survive and reproduce at higher rates than others. Because you have here a mouse that's going to come, and the mouse, the mouse is going to select for the more mild chili peppers. Therefore, the more spicy chili peppers are the ones that are going to survive and reproduce. The next generation you see here, down here at the bottom, you go from a, a let's just say you had an allele frequency, a spiciness allele frequency that has gone up or down in that next generation. It's gone up, right, because the less spicy ones have been selected for by the mouse. And we have a generational evolution. Remember, the simplest sort of definition of evolution is a change in allele frequency from one generation to the next. So you see the same exact scenario, the same process happening in a wild population that we mimic through our artificial selection programs. And so this was really important information. This is really important data, and Darwin relied on this heavily in making his natural selection uh, argument is looking at what happens through artificial selection, saying nature is now just substituting for the farmer or the you know rancher or you know whatever the, or the, the pigeon breeder. Okay, so let's stop there. Uh, we'll come back and we'll finish this one on. Okay, so um, I've actually gone through, you may notice that the PowerPoint that I posted from last semester is a little bit different than this one. I'm trying to organize these a little bit more, and so I put in these headings. So you, if when, when you go back and watch this video, you'll notice that I put those 3.1, 3.2 headings previously, which wasn't on there when we actually first looked at it. I'm doing that just so that you so that you can uh, stay a little bit more organized. And so in the book, in the fifth edition at least, they, they've added uh, a little bit. In the fourth edition, they had an example of natural selection, which we're going to talk about the Galapagos finches. But they've also added 3.3 uh, is about snapdragons, um, kind of doing the same thing that we're going to do here. You can go and read that. Uh, just to help you understand how we actually go out there and we test natural selection, but uh, just just uh, just going through one example is fine uh, here in lecture with the Galapagos finches. Okay, so and and you don't necessarily you can use 3.3 with the snapdragons to help you understand it, but I'm not going to ask you specific questions about the snapdragons on the exam. Okay, so how do we actually go about and test? in a rigorous scientific manner, uh, natural selection, evolution via natural selection. And how we're able to do that is by ba breaking down natural selection into four, what we say, different postulates that we've kind of talked about, right? That we just we talked about just barely with, with our hypothetical chili, uh, chili pepper and um, mouse example. We can actually do that in natural populations too. Obviously, because the time scale is much larger, the, the evolutionary time scale is large, you, you may not be able to test all of the postulates in every population, but sometimes we actually can test it, especially if we are fortunate enough to hit an area just right, like uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant did in the Galapagos. So they started studying finches in the Galapagos in the 70s, early 70s. Um, we know a little bit about the Galapagos, right, because of uh, our discussion about the Galapagos when we were talking about Darwin and the, the voyage of the Beagle. Um, just to reiterate, the Galapagos uh, Islands are off the coast of South America. They belong to Ecuador. Um, it, when we look at, it, so it's isolated. It's volcanic. It's isolated. Um, we think that uh, an ancestral flock of finches arrived out to the Galapagos, what, you know, probably as part of some storm event where they got blown out there about two million years ago. How many would have needed to go out there the first time there would be a viable population? Well, and so um, really, technically, all you need in some organisms is a pregnant female, right? Probably in this case, there was a handful of them, right? 
And so you're going out there, you're going to reduce the genetic diversity, and we can actually do estimates based on DNA and stuff like that to estimate uh, ancestral population sizes based on, based on the DNA. That's kind of like what we've done with cheetahs. So we know that cheetahs went through a bottleneck about 10, 12,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age. And through uh, genetic work, we have estimated that the cheetah population actually was reduced. So this is the same thing kind of as estimated from a colonization event, a bottlenecking, a, a dramatic reduction in the cheetah population. We've, we, I think there's estimates anywhere from like a couple dozen to one to 200. But the cheetah population has, so there's variation in the estimates that the, the cheetah population went in to a major bottleneck, and we can do it that way. So it totally depends on the organism. It to totally depends on how much, um, it depends on, you know, the reproductive potential of that particular organism. So I don't know specifically with the finches, but I would say probably, um, you know, maybe a couple dozen got out there, but I don't know for sure. But uh, what would that affect? I don't want to get on too many tangents, but we'll do this one tangent. Okay, uh, what would that affect? If you just had a single individual with not much genetic variation, would that affect how easily they could evolve in new traits and things like that? Would you want a larger sort of colonizing population? If you get to a place that has a whole bunch of different niches, you want to jumble up the the alleles and all of the different genes so that you could evade, you know, in, so that you could invade these different niches, you probably want a larger kind of population, right? You'd have more genetic diversity to work with. Natural selection would have more genetic diversity to work with. Yeah, but I don't know for specifically, I don't know, maybe they have done estimates. They probably have now um, done estimates on, I know they've done it um, with, uh, I know some people uh, that, pretty good friend that does Galapagos Island stuff, uh, lizard stuff, and so they're, they're, I know they're, I know, I know they've done estimates on colonizing population sizes, but yeah, interesting. Okay, so moving right along, okay, so uh, we know now there, uh, and there's, there's some variation of this, but we have 13 species uh, of finches living on the Galapagos and a 14th species living in nearby, in quotes, because it's not so nearby, but it's, you know, kind of nearby. Cocos Islands, um, and they have a massive amount of variation in uh, beak sizes and shapes between these different um, species. And in fact, if you remember, Darwin didn't necessarily identify all the finches as finches, and he was a pretty good naturalist, right? But they had so much variation and um, change in, in their morph morphology that he was actually misidentifying some of them. It wasn't, he didn't, he wasn't corrected until he got back to England and he showed it to the bird expert. Um, their beak sizes and shapes uh, make sense having a lot of variation in that because it's the primary tool they use for feeding. So you have some, uh, you have some finches that uh, specialize in, in getting nectar out of flowers and eating leaves, fruits, uh, using twigs to pry termites from dead wood, all sorts of just uh, crazy kind of uh, adaptation for resource harvesting, even some that actually uh, eat the ticks off of the, the, the iguanas, the land iguanas. We have two different species of iguanas in the Galapagos, um, a marine iguana and a land iguana. And there is a species of finch, finches that, that specialize on eating ticks from the iguanas. And so lots and lots of different, lots and lots of variations. So a very nice system to study if you're going to be studying um, evolution. And that's what the grants uh, did. There was a it was an academic couple uh, that made a career. Okay, so this is just sort of showing you some of that variation. It's not necessarily a uh, phylogenetic tree. It's just kind of a, a grouping of the different kinds of finches. You see the ground finches. You see the tree finches. So you get a partitioning of kind of the niches there, and. Um, if you remember the, if you look in the tree finch, you see the woodpecker finch. You remember Darwin identified that actually as a woodpecker, which it wasn't. It was a, it was a modified finch, cactus ground finch, large ground finch, etc. Uh, there you see the cocos finch and some of the others. So a big variation in the beaks, as you can see the beak size and shapes, and you can, uh, you know, assume, uh, you can make a pretty good guess that they're going to be 
getting resources in very different ways based on those beak shapes and size. So, so we'll get to how you identify species, right? And what what we we'll, what we'll see is that there are lots of different ways of identifying species, and there's no one hard cut way because it's like we when we're identifying species, we want to break it up. Are these a species? Are these not species? And so. Um, we will use a whole bunch of different criteria to do it. And in this case, um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those species interbred. Um, but uh, for the most part, those species are what we call quote unquote good species, where they're going to be separate evolutionary lineages or trajectories, even if there is an occasional sort of interbreeding between them. Because um, maybe there's interbreeding and the offspring aren't quite as fit, and so that sort of is a barrier to gene flow and stuff like that. I don't know if there's been hybrid studies between the different species, but it, you know, it's a fairly recent speciation, so anytime you have fairly recent speciations, there's a lot of sort of messy interbreeding uh, that, go, that goes back on. But, but for the most part, and I haven't read the specific uh, papers that propose species status for each of those. But for the most part, I think we can assume that they're good species, that there is barriers to gene flow, that they're inhabiting different niches, right? Um, with birds, too, and with matings of birds, you can usually evolve some pretty quick barriers to gene flow uh, because of their mating rituals, yeah. So here we have a whole bunch of different uh, species. You know, maybe some are better species than other spe others, because it wouldn't surprise me if there was some gene, gene exchange going on. But for the most part, let's just assume since I don't know any better, let's just assume they're pretty good species, right? Okay, so one species in particular that the grant studied was the medium ground finch. And in particular, on a little island, you see Santa Cruz there in the middle. These are the Galapagos Islands. Isabella is the largest one. Santa Cruz is down there in the middle. You have one called Daphne Major, little island just off the coast of Santa Cruz. And so this served uh, really nicely as a um, natural laboratory for them. Here, uh, you can see that there are, are color morph differences between the males and the females. They, the medium ground finches were uh, primarily seed eaters, um, but you have uh, variation within that species. You have the bigger birds eating the larger seeds, the smaller birds eating the, the, the smaller seeds. Okay, So you have variation of beak size even within this particular um, species. Yeah. So, oh, and then up here on the right, as you know, when they said a nearby neighbor Cocos, it's halfway to Central America, so it's not that close, but it's part of the same volcanic chain, right? So a lot of volcanic islands, just like the Hawaiian islands, if any of you have ever been to Hawaii, form as uh, the tectonic plate passes over a hot spot. So for instance, in, how many of you have been to Hawaii? Anybody? Which island did you go to? Uh, I mean Maui. Maui? So which island did you go to? Oh yeah, so so that the Big Island is a great one. So if you compare like the Big Island, well, big, the Big Island, Maui, they're sort of close. Then Oahu, did you fly through Oahu to go to Honolulu at all? So Oahu, um, and then Kauai, you can tell very very different sort of uh, geography in all of those islands. So like Oahu, Kauai, especially if you go to the the Grand Canyon of Hawaii, it's in it's in Kauai because it's the oldest one. Right, and it's had time to erode out a quote-unquote Grand Canyon of Hawaii. If you go to the Big Island of Hawaii, did you go to the National Park there? Did you go to Volcanoes National Park? On the Big Island, you have lots of active volcanoes. So, so you have one end where you have Kauai, the other end where you have the Big Island of Hawaii, very volcanic, very rugged. You know, not a lot of erosion has gone on on Kauai. A lot has, and that's because the plate has come by, and as it passed over the hot spot, it formed Kauai, then it formed Oahu. Then it formed uh, Maui and Lanai, those two islands, and then it formed the Big Island as the plate passed through. Same sort of thing with the Galapagos. So there can, there's a there's a there's a connection between the uh, Galapagos and the and the Cocos, even though it's not that close. That's not that close by. Okay, so looks like 
here this is a top view of the crater again indicating that it's a it's a volcanic island it um, is you know not that big um, uh, there is a, a fair amount of elevation gain because it is sort of the top the caldera part of the volcano um, and here you can see the boat landing in the figure and then you can kind of see where the boat landing and the path goes up from the shore over to their camp okay so it's an uninhabited island by humans right for the most part no permanent permanent dwellings there but it has a lot of finches on there there's a, on average about 1200 finches that live on the island uh, um, in any particular year you have some leaving some coming back some leaving some newly coming So it's very dry. So the Galapagos is very dry, and so the the fresh water are going to be like in the crater and the calderas and stuff like that. They'll have uh, from rainwater. They will have you know, some some fresh water. But yeah, fresh access to fresh water is a big issue for the organisms that live there, and even for the humans that live there. And especially, you know, since uh, historically they brought goats and stuff out there to the Galapagos, and so. That's, that's been a big problem, and in fact, the the Ecuadorian government has been trying to get get rid of the goats for a long time. They've even hired like paramilitary people from New Zealand to go out there with like automatic weapons <laughs> and try to get rid of the goats because it's been a big problem. Because it it, it is a dry sort of you know it's a dry um, sort of delicate in that sense. Um, so to test Darwin's finches, uh, to test a, a natural selection with Darwin's finches, we've got to break it down again into those postulates, right? The postulates are one, is there variation in the population? Two, is some of that variation at least uh, passed down through genes, right? Three, do individuals vary in their success uh, for, sur sur for sur surviving and or reproduction, right? And four, is the survival and reproduction non-random? So that's important, explicitly non-random. Okay, that's a real big misconception with natural selection and with evolution. In the general public, people think it's just this random thing. It's not. It's explicitly non-random. You have to have certain individuals surviving and reproducing based on a, some character which makes it explicitly non-random. Okay, so get to know these postulates. This is the second or third time we've talked about it. Make sure you understand those. Test these populations, uh, each of those individual postulates. So the first thing is an easy one to test, right? So it's, it's is there variation in the finch populations? So uh, they would go back down to the Galapagos Island, uh, use it as a as a natural experiment or a natural laboratory, set up camp, and go and capture birds through like mist netting. Has anybody ever gone to the field and mist netted? Set up nets. You let the birds fly into the nets. Then you pull the birds out of the nets, and you tag them on there with the little metal sort of ring tags or color-coded tags on their feet and then you let them go and then you can come back and you can catch them again you can identify them and you can catch them in different places and see where they're moving to and you can basically just keep track of the population by 1980 pretty much all of the the bird the finches on the island had been tagged when you tag them when you pull them out of the mist nets you will take different measurements. You'll have calipers and you'll measure wing length and tail length. You'll weigh them. Um, you, they measured uh, beak width and beak length because they were particularly interested in the beak. And those are the kind of the characters they said, okay, we're going to focus on uh, beak, uh, beak width and beak length, beak depth, etc. But, but generally, ornithologists, when they go out, they'll, 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 make, they'll make notes of all of these different measurements. In lizards, you'll, you take a measurement called snout to vent length, so it's everything but their tail. Okay, so but that's what biologists do. Have you, nobody's had any opportunity to go in the field and do this sort of stuff? It's pretty fun. Um, okay, um, so uh, it's probably not a big surprise that likely in all of those things, there's probably some variation in the population, right? Just like... In, you, in this population in here, if we measured what, you know, height and weight and no size and length and stuff like that, there's probably surprised that there was in fact 
variation here we're showing beak depth because beak depth is going to be a function of you know the size of the seeds that they can eat and you see that the beak depth there measured in millimeters uh, some into ranged all the way from 6 to 14 almost twice as much and you had an average there of about 9.4 9.3 9.5 somewhere around in there so in fact we saw it that postulate one is satisfied right we tested it in a way we made a hypothesis we said okay is there variation we can come Okay, so now we can move on to two. Is some of that variation heritable among individuals? So we see that sometimes variation is just a result of being exposed to different resources, different things in the environment, but does not have a genetic component. For something to actually evolve, there has to be a genetic component. So how would you determine that with these? If you were all, you know, on your, you know, on a summer tour, summer research uh, experience with the grants how and you were out there camped out on the island and the, the grants came to you and said hey how are we going to determine if there is actual genetic if there is a genetic component to this beak size how would you do it so you could sample the DNA right so you go you sample their DNA but all of a sudden you get back to the tent and you're like so what would you do with the DNA you would say how would you how would you, you would sample it but then what would you do with it So maybe if you need to, if you knew the genes, then you could say okay, and you could tie a gene to. But that's a that's a pretty big research, and you can't do all that in your tent, right? So we say okay, that's good. Eventually, maybe we'll do that. But what's another way that we could maybe do it? So maybe, but what would you have to connect? You'd have to. Yeah, so you're going to you're going you're going to want to connect offspring and parents, right? Um, and so if you could do kind of like remember the soapberry bug experiment from last time, you could maybe take large birds, right? Have them get together if you wanted to do it in the laboratory, have them, you know, have offspring, take those offspring and raise them with the small parents, take the small parents offspring and raise them with the large parents and see if there's a difference. That would be a good indicator. But even before that, as a first pass, and that would be a follow-up sort of, sort of um, experiment, but even before that, you can just kind of like what you were getting to before, you could just compare offspring and parents, right? So comparing offspring and parents, what sort of relationship should they have? You go out there, you measure, because you're tagging all of them, so you know which offspring, for the most part, which offspring, uh, you can connect offspring to parent, and so you would expect just in general, for large parents to have what kind of offspring? Large, large, large kids. For small parents to have, smaller parents to have smaller offspring. And that's exactly what they did. And so you can go and test it by doing a regression line and you know having a having a setting it up in a you know in the form of hypothesis testing and said, okay, is there a significant positive slope to average beak depth? For the parents, so you're taking it between the two parents, and average beak depth for the offspring. And if you have that positive slope here, are two different years, 1976, 1978, and in fact you see there's a pretty good correlation between those two. Is that, would you, if you suspected something was going on, should you probably follow up on this, or is this good enough just to say, okay, yes, there is? For the most part, if there's nothing else, you know. Uh, that is suggesting that the, the environment that the large beak parents grow up in and then therefore the large beak offspring grow up and, and the small beak one, you might be able to say that. But if you did see variation, you'd want to do it because you could have that confounding effect, right? Maybe the large beak parents are just living in a part of the island that's a much, there's a lot more resources. And so there's resources to grow large beaks, right? And maybe because there is a connection, right, in an, in knit, not niche, but in, in, in the region in which the offspring are raised, right, C comparing the two. And so then you would want to do those, those garden plant experiments like I explained before, switching the offspring or looking for genetic, actual genetic components. Uh, box 3.3 or 3.1 talk in, in the book, and it's the same in the fourth edition and fifth edition, talks about the, the issues of 
how to estimate heritability. But we see this positive slope. We've tested postulate too. Yes, it does seem to Okay, now we can move on to the third postulate. Do the individuals vary in the success at surviving and reproducing? So, fortunately for the Grants, not so fortunately for the Finches, in 1977 there was a massive drought on the islands uh, where they usually get an average rainfall of 130 uh, millimeters per year that went dramatically reduced to you know less than 20% of the normal to 24 millimeters. Um, there on the left you can see the abundance of seeds uh, through that drought dropping from you know grams per square meters where in like April of 76 it's uh, between 11 and 12 all the way down to between 3 and 4. Massive drop in the number of seeds. Here on the right in the red you see the number of finches dropping in that same sort of time period lag, lagging just a little bit. Population about 1400 all the way down to 200 in January of 1978. Massive reduction. Okay, so do individuals vary in their success uh, at surviving and reproducing? Obviously, yes. Not all the individuals survived the drought, right? So there was, a, there was a group of individuals that survived better than the rest of them that died off, right? And those individuals are obviously gonna, going to do better through reproduction. We don't have to have these you know, catastrophic events, though, to ha to fulfill postulate three. In this case, yeah, this is good evidence that only a fraction of them survive. It's good, solid evidence uh, for po that postulate three is satisfied, right? But even in our everyday lives, our reproductive potential outweighs our, uh, the, the number of individuals or offspring that we have. Right? It doesn't have. It can just be everyday stuff. It doesn't have to be a catastrophic thing. Darwin was this chart, I believe, came from Darwin, where he wanted to look at reproductive potential and what each organism's reproductive potential is and what it actually is. And so, for instance, in, in if you have if you start out with a pair of elephants, within 750 years you'd have 19 million elephants, right? Even with their slow generation time. Aphids, you'd have five, five, 524 billion in one year or something like that. So, yeah, there are potential is much larger than our actualized reproduction, right? That's not a big thing. Starfish, you know, 10.7, uh, 10 raised to the 79th power in 16 years. That's more than the number of electrons in the universe. So we have a lot of reproductive potential. Humans, you know, males are producing billions of sperm all the time, right? So do we have billions of offspring? No, right? Even females produce way more eggs than that than, than, than actually make it as offspring. Okay, so there's a lot of reproductive potential. So postulate three, uh, in this case, it was a dramatic sort of illustration of it because of the... Okay, so now move on, on to postulate four. Is, is survival and reproduction non-random. So this is saying, okay, that cohort that survived the drought, did they have some characteristic that allowed them to survive um, better? And so what they wanted to do, they could see the, the decrease in seed, seeds, right? So they ended up uh, calculating this metric that um, uh, where they could distinguish large hard seeds from basically soft small seeds, and they would give it a score. And they, and they were charting that when the drought hit. So here you can see that in, when times are good and when there's lots of rain, um, there's lots of small, soft, nice seeds, right? When the drought comes, what happens to the, to the average seed or what are the kinds of seeds that are going to survive? What's that? Yeah, the large, hard ones. They're able to survive the drought better. So this, to the grants, they were saying, okay, we can see that the large, hard Seeds are surviving better. All of a sudden, when the rains returns, what happens? What also returns? The small, soft seeds, or at least a, 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 a portion of them, right? It's not like the large, hard ones go extinct, but now you have a whole bunch of other soft, small ones that are in existence. Yeah, it's to do with the sense of like the variation of preference to the seeds, since a lot of the smaller birds aren't going to be able to take out the larger, hard ones, and so that's left to only to the, the species that can actually eat those. 
Yeah, so that's. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you, so you know, it's a lot easier to get us to eat a soft small seed to get to the good stuff of a soft small seed than a large hard one, right? And so, but you can also see where the like um, what Tyler's saying. These are going to be the ones that you know disappear. So that's what the grandchild thing is. So, so then they're saying, okay, let's predict what kind of birds do you think are going to survive the drought or the, the better? Are they going to be the smaller beaked birds? Or the larger beaked birds? Probably the larger beaked birds. Why? Because they're the ones who can access those large hard seeds. Smaller beaked birds though, why, don't, why, why then are there ever any smaller beaked birds? If the large ones can access those hard ones, right? What's that? Yeah, maybe they utilize less energy. Maybe a smaller beak too, you can manipulate and you can have a faster rate at getting at those soft small ones. Like smaller beak, they can just like really mow down the seeds quickly where the larger one, it takes them a little longer to uh, get the small soft ones. And so there's, even within the species, there's different sort of costs and benefits, right? There's cost benefits with, which, with all these. The cost benefit ratio changes depending on the environment. In the early part, there's, you know, maybe the environment is such that, you know, it, do, it doesn't really, it's not a big disadvantage to have the small beak. All of a sudden, the, the environment changes now. It's a big disadvantage to have those smaller, uh, shallower beaks because you can't crack and get at a lot of that, a lot of the hard seeds. Okay, so we can make a prediction. So now what do we do? Now that we made the prediction, what's our, ne what, what's our next step? did they went out there they tested it um, and in fact you know short long story short you see that the survivors actually the average beak length beak depth did change um, there uh, it also whittled down sort of the population too for, for you know for reasons you know, for, for, for some obvious reasons but then not some not so obvious reason because there's always stochastic or random things happening in the population too figure 13 14 and 13 15 show the beak depths of the finches, the, the, the finches that hatched. That's even a bigger sort of discrepancy than from the, from the adults. And so that's also Okay, so the next part of the second to last part of, of the chapter is uh, the nature of natural selection. It's basically saying is basically pointing out a whole bunch of things, maybe some misconceptions that people often have about natural selection. It's just a list of them. I didn't even list all of them, but these are the ones that I thought were a little bit more important. And so we're just going to kind of go through, march through, and talk about each of these. Okay, so one, natural selection acts on the individual, but the consequences is, is seen or illustrated at the population level. So natural selection does not act on a population. Natural selection does not act on the, for the benefit of the species. It acts on the individual. The individual is either going to survive and reproduce or not survive and not reproduce or survive and not have as much reproductive uh, potential. Okay, but that's acting at, that is acting on the actual individual. So here are the average beak lengths, right? The drought comes. And what happens, you get the smaller birds, natural, selecting, natural selection selecting out those smaller birds. This is just kind of a, a simple illustration of what happened with the finches. The larger birds survived. That moves the average beak uh, depth up because your smaller birds are no longer there. But you see, that, you see that change, right, at the population level, but natural selection isn't acting at the population level. It's acting on the individual, but you see the effects but it's a, it's a population level phenomenon because if you remember our, the most basic uh, explanation of or description of evolution is what? A change in what over what? A change in allele frequency over from one generation to the next, right? Allele frequency, just that term in and of itself, means that you're looking at it from a population. But natural selection isn't acting on the population. Okay, uh, natural selection acts on the phenotype, right? But the the but evolution consists of changes in the allele frequencies, right? And so that's that heredit that that's so natural selection can actually 
act upon um, characteristics that don't have a genetic component. It doesn't matter. It doesn't know if you know somebody's super buff because they have super buff genes, or super fast because they have super fast genes, or super fast because they, you know, you know, practice sprinting every day, you know, their entire life. It doesn't know. It's still going to act on that characteristic regardless of whether there's a genetic component or not. So, for instance, here, if uh, the bee, bee depth is heritable, right? You get the smaller ones getting weeded out. The larger ones then mate, have offspring, and the next generation, the beak depth, the beak, the average beak depth is larger, right? If it's not heritable, maybe it was. Maybe when we did the tested that second postulate, it was a flat line. There was no positive correlation, right? Or it's just sort of this random distribution. It wouldn't matter. The next generation, the the smaller ones get selected out. But if there's no genetic component, the next generation is you're going to have that that uh, variation reemerge because the variation is due to some sort of aspect of the um, environment, not the genetic component. So natural selection acts on the phenotype, right? But evolution can only happen if that also is acting on through the phenotype acting on the genotype. Okay, natural selection is not forward looking. It doesn't say, okay, you know, we're going to select for these dinosaur wings that are helping the dinosaurs to stay warm because eventually maybe they can fly with it as soon as we evolve big, you know, pectoral muscles or something like that. It acts on the parent, it actually is a little bit backwards looking. It acts on the environment of the parent. That's what determines what gets passed down. That what determines the composition of the offspring. But the offspring aren't necessarily adapted for their own environment. Usually it is because the environment doesn't change that much between parent and offspring. But its offspring are adapted for the parental population. If you had a dramatically changing population, you could see where you know maybe the offspring wouldn't be that adapted for their current population. But for the most part, uh, the, parental pop the parental environment and the offspring environment is the same, and so it works out. But um, natural selection is not forward-looking. Lo uh, number four, new traits can evolve even though natural selection acts on existing traits. Okay, So you don't necessarily have to have a new mutation every time uh, coming into the population, especially in uh, sexually reproducing organisms. Here this is a case with the, uh, a, a, an agricultural example of average oil content um, of uh, corn kernels. You can see here you have 100 generations. If you look down at sort of the first generation, the, the average content was 5% oil. What they did in this experiment is they took, they used that original population, right? They didn't, there, you know, maybe some mutation um, it was introduced in those 100 generations. Probably not, though. Um, mostly what is happening is you're getting new combinations through sexual reproduction of the, in, the, in the corn. And so here you take that original population, you go generation after generation after generation, and you even, you, you're artificially selecting for higher oil content, and you go from, in 100 generations from 5% all the way up to 20% oil. All of the same genetics were there in the original population, but you're just reshuffling those. That's, a, that's artificial selection though. Yeah, selection. yeah, yeah. It's just showing you. It's just taking the genes, and they're selecting for it, but they still have the same sort of gene pool and each generation, they're, they're selecting the better combinations, but it's illustrating that you can increase that, that oil content, that you can get sort of new, uh, evolve new things, even from just mixing and matching the genetics that make up the natural populations, too. Here is a great example with the panda. Um, if you look at the panda and you look at their forelimbs, they have an extra quote unquote digit, they have the five normal digits, then plus they have a, a modified uh, sesamoid bone here in red on the right. Um, basically what that sort of serves as is kind of like a, you know those cheese cutters that kind of, you can slice cheese with just the wire? It's kind of what it is. They use it to kind of slice open bamboo so that they can access the interior of the bamboo and eat and access the resources quicker. And so we all, we have uh, sesamoid, or mammals have ses sesamoid bones. Um, we can compare the sesamoid bones in the forelimb of 
the panda with other bears and uh, we can um, see uh, a comparison between just a was it a brown bear black bear oh yeah so you look at the hot the four the the the, the four limb sesamoid bones in the panda compared to the brown bear right and you can see where that has been selected for larger and larger and larger the original one was there right and you just selected for a new trait based on something uh, that had based on an original trait kind of just tinkering with or actually I was just to give the example of, of um, oh, what's that guy MacGyver and that was a really old show but apparently there's a new MacGyver movie right so now Students stopped kind of understanding what I was saying. So now you all, you all know who MacGyver is. What does MacGyver do? Has anybody seen the movie? Is it out yet? I watched the TV show. Oh, so you did see the TV series. Yeah, but I think there's a new MacGyver film coming out. So basically what he does is, you know, he can use what's present to make some very a new thing. So he can take, like, you know, a gum wrapper and... Um, a toothpick and a paper clip and make a machine gun or something, right? So he can just, you know, he can use what's there and make something really novel and new. That's what's happening with a sesamoid bo ses bone. It was there. You can see it was there in the common ancestor with the brown bear. You look at the hind one, it's pretty much the same, right? And natural selection uses what's there and evolves a new character. Natural selection does not lead to perfection. You might say, okay, how come natural selection just hasn't evolved this super creature that can fly and run fast and is super smart and leaves thousands and thousands of offspring? Because there's always trade-offs, right? This is an example with mosquito fish. Um, uh, with the trade-offs in mosquito fish, size does matter, and females prefer mosquito fish with larger uh, gonopodia. So here you look on the top, you see that bottom sort of uh, modified fin, that's the gonopodia. Females prefer to mate with males with larger gonopodia. Here on the bottom, there's a smaller gonopodia, right? So why is there, how does natural selection, how, how come all of the smaller fish, with, or the, smish, the fish with smaller gonopodia, how come they're even present? Like, why isn't it just natural selection saying, oh, we're, we're, we're going to select this, this, better, this better trait? It's because there's trade-offs, right? As you can imagine, what would be a cost of having a large gonopodium? Yeah, you can't swim as fast, and you can't, you can't get away from predators. A smaller one, you can. And in fact, this is what they see. They see, they, it, they can compare different lakes, and they can compare lakes where there's the present of a predator, not non-present of a predator. And depending on, you know, the predatory pressure, you're going to a, a, a population where there's a lot of predatory fish that are going to eat these mosquito fish. You think the gonopodia, gonopodia there are larger or smaller? They're going to be smaller. Where there's, no, where there's no predators, they're going to be larger. And so you have these different environments, and it, you have different selective pressures. It's always, it doesn't evolve, lead to perfection, because there's characteristics. Here, sexual selection, same sort of thing. The peacock tail, there's a cost to it, and there's a benefit to it. The benefit to it is it's nice and pretty, and the peacock with a nice big tail, Gets all the ladies, right? What's the what's the that's the benefit of it? What's the cost of it? You attract a lot of. Yeah, you attract predators, and have, have you ever gone to Hogo Zoo and chased the peacocks? It's really as kids, none of you did that. Yes. Yeah, so you go and you chase them, and you can actually if, if if the peacocks you don't chase the females, right? Because they can get away easily. You chase the males, right? Okay, so there that just like with predators would be the same thing. So that's something that's called selection. Okay. Natural selection is non-random, right? It selects for the character that's favored, but it's not necessarily progressive. Okay, we sort of think of that in the in the in the geologic column. We can see, you know, a progression towards more complex organisms and things like that. But that's not always the case. And the big, the best example of that is when different species invade cave systems, and so you have the ancestral species that is 
or the ancestral population or the ancestral species that is more complex than the uh, evolved species, right, or de-evolved species. And you see that with, for instance, uh, cave fish that lack pigment, lack eyes. Um, you see that with, uh, you see that with parasites a lot of times, right? So a tapeworm, the ancestors of tapeworms were, were much more complex than tapeworms, okay? So you have a complex ancestor, you have a tapeworms evolving and basically evolve, de-evolving, right, into uh, a more simple organism that just sort of sits in your GI tract and absorbs and absorbs nutrients. Okay, you have snakes. The example of snakes is it evolved from a quote unquote more complex organism that had four limbs, right, to a less. Okay, also uh, selection acts on individuals, not necessarily for the good of the species. And this uh, uh, altruistic, th this has altruistic behavior, this sort of explains altruistic behavior. Right? So it might look and appear that, it, that, that individuals within a population are acting for the good, of the, the good of the species, good of the population, but when you look at it further, you see that they actually have to be having some sort of evolutionary benefit, meaning their genes being passed down to the next generation. So uh, prairie dogs standing watch over a prairie dog town, sees a hawk, it squills, it makes an alarm, Everybody else jumps into the holes. It is acting in a way, right, that is calling attention to itself. So you say, well, how could that behavior evolve? The, the, the reason that it evolves is that it evolves is because either that prairie dog that's, that's standing sentinel, right, standing guard, it has its DNA being passed down vicariously through another individual, more important than this now, then it, but thanks, then, then another individual or... Um, it has reciprocated benefit. It's not always going to be standing there, right? They're going to take turns, and overall, it's beneficial, but it has to have that individual benefit of passing more genes to the next generation. Okay, you see the same thing uh, with uh, lion, um, uh, lion packs, where uh, non-mothers will sometimes nurse cubs of other mothers. You know, they'll sort of share in the nursing. Uh, of the offspring and it okay so we're getting to the last part this is uh, the uh, or second to last part the evolution of evolutionary biology we've already talked about this earlier uh, there were a bunch of problems if you know if you remember last time we talked about a bunch of problems from a scientific perspective of evolution via natural selection in Darwin's time and even when Darwin uh, died uh, one was with how things are um, passed down, blending inheritance. We talked about Gregor Mendel. We talked about Madame Curie and Lord Kelvin estimating the Earth to be only on the order of millions of years old. It wasn't until we discovered, rediscovered radioactivity that we actually um, were able uh, to have a, an Earth old enough that it's re it, is re it was reasonable to say, okay, uh, this is evolution via natural selection is a reasonable explanation for the generation of all this biodiversity. The other one that we didn't really talk about is where does new variation come from and Thomas H. Morgan and his Drosophila fly lab uh, demonstrated mutation and that mutations could be positive. And so these, this was sort of the evolution of evolutionary biology post. We'll move on to the last section. The last section is about intelligent design and creationism. It goes into okay two minutes it goes in to sort of the history of creationism um, you've all most of you have probably seen uh, the intelligent design on trial video I have a link to it at the end of this that you can go and just become familiar with it there's a couple of other court cases that I want you to be familiar with first one is the scopes trial 1925 in Tennessee uh, this was a response to the Butler Act that basically said that teachers couldn't teach evolution, that they had to teach a literal interpretation of the creation of biblical account of the creation of man. Um, 1925, uh, um, it, it was a big thing. The Scopes trial was this big sort of phenomenon. It had some really, really prominent uh, attorneys that were involved. One was a, an ex uh, presidential candidate. Another one was this, like, sort of Johnny Cochran of the day, where he was he had defended these uh, 
these teenage kids in Chicago that had killed just for fun somebody else. So it was this big high profile uh, trial. It was, everybody was talking about it. It, uh, because of it, it, it had a lot of people talking about evolution, right? So 1925 is a time when you look at, especially like within sort of religious uh, history, or at least in, in the U.S., so for instance, locally, um, with, uh, within the, um, like for instance, within the LDS Church, they issued a statement, a restatement of an original, uh, an original sort of uh, interpretation of evolution. They did that in 1925 because of the Scopes trial. Who's reading Evolution of Mormonism? Yeah, so if you remember 1909, Joseph F. Smith, who was the leader of the Mormon Church, issued the Origin of Man in 1925. The, the leader of the Mormon Church was Heber J. Grant, reissued the Origin of Man, took out a lot of the anti-evolution stuff in 1925. But And we, and we saw this again then in, um, uh, in these anniversary dates. We saw it even in 2009. There was a whole, a whole bunch of other general discussion on evolution because 2009, like 1909, was the... Uh, 1909 was the 50 year anniversary of the publishing of The Origin of Species and the 100 year anniversary of the birth of Darwin. 2009, same sort of anniversary date. Okay, so it was. So the Scopes trial happened in a small town in Tennessee, Dayton, Tennessee. Um, the, the defendant in the trial was a guy by the name of John Scopes. He was actually a substitute teacher and he was asked by a group of local businessmen, kind of a chamber of commerce um, in Dayton, to come in and teach evolution specifically so that they could challenge that, right? And they could, they could uh, have this, this court case. It was, it, you might wonder, okay, what, what, does the, what does the chamber of commerce, commerce, what interest do they have in teaching of evolution? But they actually devised this plan to sort of drum up attention for Dayton and drum up business. You know, uh, they knew that it would be a, you know, a sensationalized um, trial. They probably didn't know it was going to get as big as, as it was, but they knew that it would, it would serve, um, uh, it, it would be widely reported on because it was challenging the Butler Act. It was ch challenging the constitutionality of the uh, Butler Act. So as I mentioned before, there were a couple of uh, two big names um, in the trial. One was the defense attorney. He, that was Clarence Darrow. I mentioned that he had just uh, become famous kind of defending the, the two rich kids in the Leopold and Loeb trial in Chicago. After the Scopes trial, he actually uh, took on another very famous case. It was the Osen Sweet case. This was a this was a case where in Detroit, uh, an African-American doctor uh, had bought a house in an all-white neighborhood. Um, his family had moved into the house, and a, a, a white mob came and tried to forcibly evict them. Um, the, the family defended themselves, and in the, and in the melee, shot and killed, um, killed one of the, the white mobsters. And so um, uh, Clarence Darrow actually, Darrow actually successfully defended um, Dr. Dr. Sweet. Um, so he was a big time, uh, very famous, very popular um, attorney. On the other hand, for the prosecution, we had William Jennings Bryant, who was a former congressman, and secretary of state, and had run for president several times. So big time news, big time sort of trial. It was dubbed the trial of the century. In the end, Scopes was found guilty, fined $100. Um, and, but more importantly, sort of culturally, uh, the effect of the trial were, were a couple of things. One, it kind of uh, revealed this widening gap between American Christians and science. And two, it actually sort of formalized the anti-evolution crusade that crusade spread to other states, and it's still kind of a crusade that we're dealing with today with regards to what is taught in high school um, high school biology classes. We still, as I read just a couple weeks ago, still a fight with what gets into the textbooks in Texas um, about what is taught uh, with
with regards to evolution, and, and now some other subjects too. Um, so here, this link is actually a link to a classic film called *Inherit the Wind*. It had Gregory Peck in it, um, and it just—it's just just the trailer. So, I, so I want you to watch that and just kind of so you can get a feel to feel about uh, the trial, kind of what a what a big sensation um, it was. So that was sort of the state of affairs for about the next half century until in 1968 under um, a case called Epperson versus Arkansas. The Supreme Court struck down another law, not the Butler Act, but another law that, had, that, was, that prohibited the teaching of evolution. This was a, a blow to the creationists. In response to that, a bunch of groups sort of reformulated their arguments and decided that rather than trying to um, force biology teachers not or make it a, uh, make it a, a crime to teach evolution in the biology classrooms, they just said, "Okay, we're going to try to create a creation science and then demand equal time um, for creation science and uh, equal time for creation science." Uh, as to evolutionary science, and so a couple of different groups formed. One of the more prominent for more, one of the more prominent groups was the Institute uh, for Creation Research, uh, or the Creation Science. They they formed the Creation Science Research Center. This was started by a guy a guy by the name of Henry Morris. Um, it else that group also has ties to another group that we've talked about a little bit in the past, and that's Answers in Genesis. So it's all kind of the same sort of people involved and the same sort of groups um, involved. And so they decided, okay, we're going to try to get equal time for creation science. But then in 1987, in another case, Edwards versus Aquilard, the Supreme Court said that creation science is not science. It's essentially a religious idea. And so teaching it in public schools is a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which is the separation of church and state. So after that defeat, um, the creationists had to again, you know, sort of reevaluate their strategy. And you have to give it to them, they're fairly tenacious, but they decided, okay, we're going to drop creation or any reference to a creator at all. They did that from, from their literature and they instead decided to begin to argue for uh, an intelligent designer or for this, this notion of intelligent design. Another kind of uh, word that's associated with that is irreducible complexity. And so uh, to understand what intelligent design is, and it's an actually a very, very old concept. It goes back uh, to pre-Darwinian days. Um, but let's just take a second and, and sort of define and try to understand what exactly intelligent design is. So intelligent design is just a repackaging of this old notion of natural theology that we've talked about before. If you remember natural theology were uh, priests and pastors and, and theologians that would go into nature to try to understand the creator by, under, by getting to know their creation. That was one of the reasons that Darwin wanted to become a country pastor. He had read a very, you know, a, a book by who's probably considered the father of natural theology. That's William Paley. Um, this was one of Darwin's favorite books growing up because it described nature and it described it uh, from the perspective of describing the creation. And part of natural theology is this notion that you know the world is so majestic, life is so complex, organisms are so well or well engineered that there just has to be some sort of conscious designer for it. That's the notion of natural theology. That's a notion of intelligent design. Intelligent design, more specifically with regards to this term irreducible complexity, would say something like, the human eye is so complex that you can't take away a part of it. You can't make it less complex because then it loses the entire function. The uh, a statement by you know, an intelligent design person would be something like, what is 
the use of a half an eye, right? And so William Paley made the argument that if you were just walking along a beach or walking, he was English, so walking along the heath, and all of a sudden you stumbled upon, you hit, you stubbed your toe on something on the ground, you looked down on the ground, and there's a watch, a functioning watch down there. You wouldn't have to know anything else uh, about that watch, but you could see its complexity, and you could say, okay, this thing is so complex that this watch had to have a maker. There had to be a watchmaker. There had to be a designer. Right. Um, even if you didn't had no other information about a designer or anything else, that's that's the that's the basic argument of intelligent design. Paley actually used the example in his book of the of the eye, saying the eye is so complex that it just couldn't have sort of spontaneously come together and formed. That it had to have some sort of conscious designer designing. I'm sure most of you have, uh, you know, had discussions along those same lines before. I had lots of different times. I'd heard that lots of different times growing up. Um, really, what this is, there's really two issues here. It's saying how can randomness lead to order and complexity, right? And two, the second issue is how can complex structures like the vertebrate eye come into being through the accumulation of small changes? i.e. how what good is half an eye what good is half of a bird wing type of an argument um, so the randomness issue is one a sort of a misunderstanding about uh, natural selection and evolution if you remember when we were looking at when we were, when we were learning about the postulates evolution and natural selection is explicitly non-random but you get this misunderstanding i mentioned that i had I had, you know, heard these kind of stories a bunch growing up. Here, this is a picture uh, on the bottom here of Mount Olympus in Salt Lake. I grew up right in the foothills of Mount Olympus. Um, and I remember having somebody tell me, you know, had me look up at Mount Olympus, and they said, see Mount Olympus there? There's enough gold and metals and, and petrol, oil and stuff in Mount Olympus that if you took a whole bunch of dynamite and you blew up Mount Olympus, that there is a possibility, there's a slight, slight, slight probability that all of those materials could come together all at once and out of that explosion you would get a fully functioning um, brand new pink Cadillac with a full tank of gas ready to go. There is, a, there is, you know, it is possible that all these things could just randomly come together and have that. So as a kid, you're just like, yeah, but that's really, really, that's really not very possible. And this person followed up by saying, that's the probability that evolution is true. Okay, so that's saying all this randomness, very, very impossible that uh, it, it would happen. Okay, what's wrong with this line of reasoning? So two problems. First, we've already mentioned that it isn't actually random. It isn't a random process. It's an explicitly non-random process. You know, the organisms that survive and reproduce are a non-random sampling each generation based on certain characteristics that uh, increase their evolutionary fitness. So it's really non-random things happening over an extremely long period of time it's not just an instant random act. So that's one fallacy in that sort of, in that sort of thinking. The other thing, is, the other reason that it, it's not a very good analogy is that we're looking at something that's already occurred and then trying to assign a probability to it, even, if, even, even given the first sort of fallacy that we talked about. It's almost like if you were to go down to Wendover, right, and you sat down at a... Uh, Texas Hold'em or something table, right? And you were dealt these cards, these these. Oh, we'll just say that not five cards. Those six cards right there: uh, nine of hearts, eight of hearts, jack of hearts, or ace of uh, spades, king of diamonds, and five of not spades, not clover. What do you call those cards? Clubs. <laughs> Sorry, ace of clubs and a 
five of clubs. Okay, what's the probability that you were dealt that hand? There is no probability, right? But what they try to do is say, okay, let's assign a probability that you were dealt that hand. What would it be? What's the probability that you were that you were would draw a, a nine of clubs first? It's one over the total number of cards, right? So it's one in fifty-two. Then what is the probability that you'd then be that you would then be given an eight? It'd be one over fifty-one. And then a jack would be one over fifty. Uh, ace of clubs would be one over forty-nine. Um, a king of a king of uh, diamonds would be one over forty-eight. And then your sixth card, a five of clubs, that would be one over forty-seven. Okay, what's the total probability that that happened? Well, if you do the calculation, there's a one in fourteen trillion six hundred fifty-eight billion one hundred thirty-four million and four hundred chance that that happened. That's not very likely. Is that a miracle? Right? Is there? Is that? Is should you use that? To try to convince somebody that they just didn't get that those six cards, no, because you're looking at it in retrospect. So that's the second fallacy. Now, with regards to the evolution of complex structure, like the eye or immune system or or any sort of other complex structure you want to that you want to you know use as an example, and the, and the examples continue to sort of change, um, that's, that's a more legitimate sort of, you know, concern. It's like, okay, how can, how can you explain small changes uh, translating into large changes where you have a complex structure that it's not easily, easy to see how a, a large complex, not large, but a complex structure could emerge from a less complex structure. It's like a kind of an all or nothing thing. And that's, that, that's a legitimate concern. That was a legitimate concern of Darwin. Darwin spent time looking at that uh, with regards to, to the, the complex eye, the camera eye. Um, but what we see is that in order for those things to occur, each of those structures doesn't necessarily have to have a reduced form of the final structure or um, the final sort of thing that it does, but you can actually have you can actually have um, functional intermediates. So you could have intermediate forms that serve a different function than the final form. So what we call these are, are pre-adaptations, right? If you remember just barely a little while ago, we were talking about the sesamoid bone in the panda, the sesamoid bone in the panda before it started using it sort of as that, that wedge structure to get to the insides of a bamboo shoot, it was used as the normal function as part of uh, a bone that you know, has some sort of function in stability of a wrist or motion of the wrist or something, right? Um, it, is, it doesn't have necessarily have to be the exact same function. We see this with feathers, dinosaurs. Uh, dinosaur feathers uh, in a large number of cases, we see that the feathers aren't just used for flight, but maybe originally they were used to for signaling, maybe they were used for thermal regulation, and once they were there and natural selection selected them uh, to help with thermal regulation, they're already there and then you can sort of MacGyver it, right? And natural selection can select it for a, another function. Okay, but uh, it seemed and it, but it but it seems like you know we should at least have some examples of these intermediate uh, these functionally intermediate structures if we were to go out and survey um, the the you know natural world we should be able to see some of these and the book goes into a bunch of different examples of that we won't go into all of them but we'll just go into the classic and take a second look at the classic um, I example. So we actually do see functional intermediates in the natural world. One great example of this is within the phylum uh, mollusca. Mollusca, if you remember, has uh, organisms, well-known organisms such as squid, octopus, cuttlefish, etc., that have very nice, complex uh, structures that we call 
the camera eye, right? As you can see there on the bottom right, that's sort of uh, an example of the camera eye. But not only does it have a camera eye that serves a function of being able to see very well, you know, being able to hunt um, prey items with it, but it also has functional intermediates going all the way back. If you go look at number A, you can say, okay, here is a functional intermediate. It's not really very complex. It's not nearly as complex as the functional camera eye, right? But it does have a layer of pigment cells that is innervated and can sense light. So could there be a function besides just like great vision for the example in A? And of course there is. If you were just be if you were just only able to sense light versus dark living in the ocean, that might at least give you an idea of which way is up towards the ocean surface and which way is down towards the ocean bottom. If you take that layer of cells and fold it in, you actually now get a situation where you can not only see light versus dark, but you can actually give a little you can actually get a little bit of orientation to that where you could see, okay, a shadow moving across and what direction that shadow is moving moving in between you and the light source from which direction it's coming. So that could also be very functional. That could also at least, you know, elicit some sort of, you know, swim fast reaction and you'd be able to escape, you know, better predators better than an organism that didn't have that. And as you see in each of these different cases, and um, if you remember in the intelligent design or uh, intelligent design on trial um, video that I mentioned before and that I have linked at the very, uh, very end of this um, lecture, uh, it goes into, it has a section where it talks about the evolution of the camera eye. And so as you can see, you actually do have functional intermediates between the very simple sort of photo uh, sensory sort of organ, or not even organ, but layer of tissue to a functional camera eye. And really importantly is if we look at the camera eye in mollusk, we compare that to the camera eye in detropods, it, they're both very complex, they're both very useful and very good, but they have actually have different ways of doing it. This again, suggests independent origins and gives us evidence that, okay, maybe natural evolution via natural selection is actually occurring. So to end, here are, are a number of sort of video clips. Um, you don't have to watch all of them. I'm just showing you these to give you uh, an idea of, you know, one, that the creation evolution debate is still going on. We still, you know, it still makes its way onto uh, news broadcasts and things like that. But I just want you to kind of look at these and uh, the longer ones, you don't have to like that Richard Dawkins one, it's a whole hour lecture. You're welcome to listen to it if you want, but you don't necessarily have to. But I just want you to get a, get a little taste of it. Here's another one, it's a little bit newer, it has Wolf Blitzer in it. And here's the link uh, that I mentioned earlier to Judgment Day Intelligent Design on Trial, a, a Nova film. Most of you have already seen it as part of the 1110 lab. Um, if you haven't, uh, go uh, check it out. You don't necessarily have to take really great notes or whatever, but I at least want everybody to be familiar with the Dover trial and kind of what happened in the Dover trial. Okay, good luck on the exam.